Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in at, uh, at home to our 420 virtual summit. We're really excited to have everybody here today. Um, as uh, you can tell, the theme of our event is cannabis. Uh, we have a really exciting discussion lined up today with three representatives who have been integral here in the state of Illinois at uh, getting the, the cannabis legislation passed. Uh, we've got Representative Lou Lang. Uh, say hi, Lou. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Representative Sonia Harper. Hello, everyone. And Representative Kelly Cassidy. Hey, y'all. Uh, so as I'm sure all of you are aware, cannabis has been uh, kind of at the forefront of uh, news cycles, business, uh, et cetera, in our country uh, for the last few years now. And, um, you know, we, we've gone from uh, a black market industry to building, um, uh, building an economic powerhouse uh, is where we're at. And it all starts with legalization. And that's what we're here to, to talk about today. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll, we'll kind of jump into it. And I'm sure everybody at home is wondering, um, why cannabis? What inspired you folks to pick up this fight and uh, what accomplishments are you most proud of so far? Well, let me start. So uh, many years ago, uh, people came to me in my office to discuss the issue of uh, medical cannabis. As you know, that's where it started in the state of Illinois. That's what's started in most states. Um, and when they came to me, they came to my office and we had a long discussion. And these were people in wheelchairs and people who were very sick and people who wanted us to pass a law in the state of Illinois to allow for the use of medical cannabis. And I said, sure, I'll vote for it. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. We want you to sponsor it. We want you to pass it for us. And I said, I don't think I'm your guy. I, I'm the guy who didn't even try this in high school or college. And they said, no, no, you're the guy. And they, of course, appealed to my ego and eventually uh, my ego won out. Uh, and uh, as my colleagues know, it took us five plus years to bring this to the goal line and we did. Uh, and in so doing, Illinois created the uh, safest, most highly regulated uh, medical cannabis law in the nation uh, became a model for other states. Some thought it was too restrictive, and uh, I agree, it was probably too restrictive, but we did what we had to do to pass it, to get our foot in the door, and that, of course, led to amazing things, which uh, uh, Kelly will talk about, uh, amazing things in the area of uh, recreational cannabis, uh, which is just about to explode in our state as we have licenses for dispensaries issued in just a couple of weeks from now. Honestly, for me, uh, you know, I grew up on a barrier island in Florida in the 70s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a product that, that I have been around and the people involved in the product I've, have been around me my whole life. I saw families torn apart um, by the criminalization of this product. I had friends whose parents went away um that's the, that was the euphemism we used um you know dad went away and um so i always carried the the knowledge of that injustice with me and then um sort of by happenstance found myself working in the criminal justice uh arena and working within the system but as a person who was specifically brought in to bring about change and to question the status quo um, and so working within the, the state's attorney's office for 15 years, I saw how, um, you know, truly messed up the narcotics prosecution systems are in this country and, and what, um, what harm has been done uh, to communities, to families, to entire uh, uh, cities. And, and so when I came into the General Assembly in 2011, and actually, ironically enough, today is the ninth anniversary of my appointment to, to the General Assembly. And yeah. um, Lou, one of those folks uh, that was in your office that day, um, I posted my Facebook memory about, about winning the appointment and Sandy responded, Sandy Champion responded, um, I remember, and, and I responded, yeah, you remember thinking there's this crazy new rep who thinks she's gonna legalize weed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she responded, yeah, I did think you were crazy. Um, and, you know, Lou was kind enough to make me chief co on the medical bill on day one. And really, um, I mean, we had a, a many year relationship before that. So it was fun to partner with him on something like this immediately 
um, and, and work that roll call and, and um, be there when it did get across the finish line. Um, but the, the end of Lou's race was the beginning of mine. And we started working on the criminal justice reform components right away, um, including the low level possession ticket bill. Um, the, uh, we, we worked around that for a while too. As I joke, it's the bill so nice we passed it twice uh, because we had to overcome a gubernatorial veto. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, with, with last year's passage of the, the adult use bill and the multi-year incredibly collaborative effort that went into that. Um, but really, you know, going about it from that space of, of reform and equity and justice, um, you know, just as Lou said the, that our medical bill became a model for the country, um, our bill and frankly our process, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you, Sonia, um, has become a model for the other states who are following us. Like, you know, when I hear from advocates who, you know, think that, that the, the process in their state has been too shut down, too, too um, exclusive, they, they come to us and ask how we built that coalition, how we brought people in. And, and, and so it's not just the substance of the bill, but the style by which the, the, the sponsors um, went about it that's, that's changing the way laws are being made around the country. And it's kind of cool and fun to talk to those folks so often, so yay. So what brought me to this, you know, world of legalization in Illinois, um, I was already involved in believing, you know, like, like that was already said that food is medicine, um, that we have everything right on, on this earth. God gave us what we need to heal ourselves. And so I come from more of so of the agricultural background and the, the uh, food access and advocacy background and, and using local foods to empower people, not only through their health, um, but through their community economics and development as well. And so in my community in Inglewood, you know, we were already figuring out ways we could use our land to grow food, to grow medicine, to teach people um, how to heal themselves the proper way, because I truly believe that food is medicine and that if we eat right our entire lives, um, that maybe we won't have such short lives and maybe we won't get to the point um, where we have to have such restrictive diets from our doctors if we eat healthy and wholesome our entire lives. And I think that that lends itself um, to natural medicine and herbal medicine. And of course, marijuana um, is the number one um, herb out there that has been used for centuries to heal people of basic everyday elements, right? So I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna yell from the rooftops for marijuana just as much as I'm gonna yell from the rooftops about basil, about oregano, <laughs> about any other herb, about tomatoes, about cucumbers, about <laughs> eggplant, because it's all is medicine and we need it all um, in, in in healthy doses, right, of everything. We need it all um, to heal our bodies. And coming from, again, a community that is a food desert where most of the people here are dying from preventable diet-related diseases because we don't have access to fresh and healthy food and fresh and healthy medicines, be they natural or, you know, be they the regular pharmacy kind, and how we're already seeing deaths in our communities from that. And now even in the light of COVID-19, we're definitely seeing how that disproportionate impact of food access and, and access to health care is now um, killing more Black people than everything. And so being involved in the legalization um, of marijuana, and of course, in the most social equity way possible was very important to me, um, was very important, of course, and also coming from a community that has been hit hard and still suffers the daily effects of the failed war on drugs right here in my community in West Inglewood. Um, it was very important to me that, you know, we not only legalize it for all of the health benefits and and so that people can make money off of it, but so that we can also heal the damage done to our communities. And maybe how can we also put the people who have been harmed most um, in line to receive the most benefits from that, right? be it money in the form of tax revenue coming back to the communities, or be it making sure that they're first in line um, for opportunities in this new business. And along with that comes with creating as many potential avenues to enter the marketplace and lowering and reducing as many barriers as possible 
possible for your every regular uh, everyday citizen to get into business. As we know in my community, it's hard for a person to get into any type of regular business. And so I'm happy that I was able to work with such a wonderful and broad coalition of legislators and advocacy people and agencies from across the state and even um, partners to work through and come up um, what we saw at that time um, as, as being a good starting point for the country's most equitable uh, cannabis leg legislation. And I look forward to continuing to work with all those entities um, as we continue to open up even more opportunities, health-wise, economic-wise, and definitely uh, getting back and repairing people hurt more by the war. This is the starting point, right? Like, we, I love when we talk about, you know, January 1, 2020 was not the finish line. Um, exactly. It was the beginning. It was the beginning of legalization. It was the end of prohibition. Um, right. and, and so we know there's a lot more work to do. Well, I think everybody is, uh, is, is happy to know that the folks who are leading this charge are very passionate about it and have, um, you know, personal reasons as well uh, why, why they've picked up this fight. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Representative uh, Cassie, Representative Lang, you uh, you both spearheaded um, the the legalization bills, both HB one and HB fourteen thirty eight. Um, so, how long did it actually take to pass these bills, and were there unexpected challenges that came up, or maybe some groups that were were negatively affected that uh, that we didn't even think about? So, on the uh, medical cannabis law, which is called the Compassionate Use of Cannabis. Uh, it took five years to pass, two years in the regulatory process. Uh, interestingly, uh, when I first got the first bill, which wasn't going to pass be because it allowed for everyone to grow everything they wanted at home without any regulation. So that wasn't going to work too well. But throughout the process of the first year or so, I eyeballed every legislator. I tried to determine who was for this and who was not for this. And in the very first year in the Illinois House, when you, where you need 60 votes to pass a bill, I had less than 30 legislators prepared to vote for it. Um, two years later, after I spent a lot of time and a lot of advocates came down to Springfield and talked to members one at a time, uh, we found that we had um, 90 members of the House who were for medical cannabis, but less than 50 of them were prepared <laughs> to actually vote for it. Uh, we were still at a time in Illinois and in this country where there was a lot of stigma attached to this product, a lot of political pushback, and a lot of fear. Um, and it wasn't until uh, the tide seemed to change in the country, the momentum seemed to change in terms of the safety of this product, the usefulness of this product, uh, and the widespread use of this product among people legally and illegally, uh, that we were able to change the minds and hearts of legislators. We finally got to a point where we changed the bill, redrafted it, redrafted it, redrafted it, and passed it with a bare majority. Uh, but that's all you need. You don't need to shut the other side out. You just need enough votes to pass it. Uh, and then it finally passed the Senate. We got Governor Quinn to sign it. Uh, and then we went many months through a process of rules, uh, applications, grading, and scoring. And then on his way out of office, Governor Quinn did not actually issue the licenses. So I had to beg Governor Rauner, the new governor, uh, who was not exactly on my invite list to actually issue the licenses, and he did. Uh, and it was, uh, it has been working out very, very well. Uh, and it was a strong precursor to the bill that Kelly and others passed this year, allowing for recreational cannabis. Uh, wow, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's wild how long it takes to actually get legislation passed. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that folks don't necessarily see all the time who aren't involved in the legislative process who, or, uh, or who don't keep up with it. I mentioned that I came in right at the end as, as uh, you know, Lou was, was finalizing that roll call and, and I was part of some of those conversations about, you know, yeah, there's 90 of you, but, <laughs> um, but you know, Similar to Lou, you know, people look at when Heather and I introduced the first version of the adult use bill. So it was three years from that introduction to passage. 
Um, but the reality is it was, you know, from the day that I landed there um, in 2011. Um, and, you know, when we started, when we finished medical and started talking about the, the um, civil enforcement bill, the ticket bill, we figured we were about seven years from having even the first bare chance of passing adult use. We got it done in six uh, from that moment. Um, so like, I feel like I have a bonus year in my pocket to use later somehow. <laughs> um, <laughs> <I didn't retire. laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but it, it's, it was three years from the, the first, the introduction of the placeholder bill. Cause the first bill looks nothing like what we ended up with after the process of, um, dozens of town halls, hundreds of stakeholder meetings, um, tens of thousands of miles on my car. Um, you know, we, like Lou, you know, he says, you, you want 60, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to run the table. Um, and so we wanted to make sure everyone was heard. We wanted to make sure that everyone's concerns were, were validated. Um, but that didn't mean we were going to win everybody over. Um, so, you know, we would, we were meeting with folks who were, you know, all the way in the, in the hell no category, you know, <laughs> and we'd have those conversations too. Um, and, but it was, it was incredibly worthwhile. Um, and, and I think resulted in, you know, a, a, something that I think we can all be proud of. Um, not every conversation was easy. Uh, there were a lot of times where it took everything everybody had to just keep everyone at the table. Um, cause there were a lot of moments when it would have been much easier to just walk away. Um, and, and, you know, I've got a lot of gratitude to the folks who stuck it out, even when they knew they weren't going to get their way. Um, you know, from the, from all sides of the spectrum, all ends of the spectrum, um, because it resulted in a, in a, in a much better package, but better product, if you will. Um, it, but it, it's, uh, I, I, w I was joking that I was looking forward to a quiet or legislative session this year. I don't think I meant it quite this way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, everybody was like, what are you going to do for an encore after last year? Like, well, apparently I'm going to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, uh, speaking of staying home, uh, we're sitting here right now in the wake of COVID-19. Um, unprecedented times for the entire country. I mean, we're all kind of locked down. We're confined to spaces. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been a challenge for all of us. And I think one of the things that people have been looking to, uh, to kind of help alleviate that stress is cannabis, right? It's been deemed essential in our state. Uh, so all these dispensaries are still operating. Um, but during this uh, kind of tumultuous and honestly scary time, we do have folks uh, who are, especially the immunocompromised, um, that are, are, are scared to go to a dispensary. It, it increases their risk of infection and they're, they're, you know, they're just trying to get their medicine. Um, so this has brought up the point of uh, home delivery. And uh, mm -hmm. Representative Harper, I know you've, uh, you've introduced a, a bill to try and speed this up. So what are your thoughts on home delivery? And uh, if they're positive, is there a way that we can speed this process up given our current situation? Well, sure. Home delivery um, was just actually a follow-up um, it was something that we wanted to be included, you know, in the original bill. And, you know, like Representative Cassidy said, you know, January 1st, it wasn't the end of the bill. It was part of the whole process. And so I didn't just introduce home delivery. I also introduced a social consumption bill, which obviously in these times is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, and I also introduced a bill um, that, that would create a cannabis equity commission as well to ensure that from here on out, through eternity, no matter who the administration is, that equity goals um, are being followed. And so, you know, being that we now have the stay at home order and, you know, there are restrictions on people going um, into stores and especially dispensaries. And, you know, I even see um, at some dispensaries, people standing outside waiting in line because of the new restrictions on being able to go um, inside. There is lots of of interest in getting this legislation either passed quickly or seeing um, if the governor perhaps can provide for, you know, some, some, some extra, um, you know, some extra precautions during this time to allow dispensing organizations to either deliver or, 
you know, to, to, to see if we can hurry up and pass that type of license. So I don't think that that's something that's number one on our agenda right now. We want to make sure that people are safe during the COVID crisis. While I do, you know, know that people in the industry or some consumers may think that that's important, I do think that we're right now concerned on making sure that people are, are healthy and are safe right now and flattening this curve. Um, but I do, um, and I haven't heard, you know, I don't know what, what we're going to be moving when we get back to session or if we'll even have time to get that legislation passed. Mm -hmm. I do know that, um, th that that's something, again, that's not high on the list of priorities. And, you know, I'll see when we go back to Springfield what folks' feelings are around that and even um, speaking more with the governor's office. But I know that I myself have not been involved in trying to push anything other than protecting my community um, at this time, while I'm sure that people are very interested in delivery. I also wanted to bring up a very important point um, that I think delivery is important and you know, especially for patients, and may, and may be so in times like these, but my legislation is not ready to go right now. It would need a whole lot more work. I'm really interested in not just allowing current organizations who are dispensaries to be allowed to deliver, but really figuring out how do we open up that marketplace to get more people in um, at the ground level, and how do we open up more opportunities for them to have their own businesses. And that's what I was thinking with delivery. What I was thinking in delivery is how do we have um, perhaps something like an Uber cannabis or uh, or systems where people can open up smaller businesses, sensory or other than a cultivation center, but that they can also get in on this business. And so that's my goal for delivery, even though I know um, right now we think that that would be very convenient for our situation. So being that I don't see that, that, that that's anywhere ready to go right now. <laughs> it's interesting to note that the state is now taking applications for transportation licenses for cannabis. This was uh, initially thought of as just simply a way to license folks who are delivering product from the cultivator to the dispensaries. Uh, but it would be a simple hop and skip to uh, go to a place where these uh, people would that end up with the transportation licenses can do some home delivery. I think it's a great idea, a great concept. And if there's something I can do to help Sonia, you'll let me know. I do think it's also a great opportunity for fledgling businesses because unlike the growing licenses and the dispensary licenses, there's an unlimited number with no cap of the transportation licenses. So anybody that wants to get into the transportation. At business. a pretty low fee too. Correct. All they need to do is file the application and likely just not be a felon and they're likely to be able to get that license and start a business where they could be delivering product. And if we go to a place where uh, product is allowed to be delivered directly to consumers, uh, I think there will be many opportunities and uh, create the kind of businesses you were talking about. And, and if I could just uh, piggyback on a little bit, we have had conversations, uh, you know, the, the, the core team and, and Sonia gets pulled in periodically as well. We, we constantly check in with each other about what's happening and what's going on. And, you know, that, that model that you mentioned, Lou, is probably the, the, the likeliest easy path to home delivery is because you'll have that ready-made core. Um, but in terms of the current situation, um, the, the governor's uh, team has made clear that because there is a specific prohibition for home delivery in our statute, that he's not able to, to uh, create that, that, that scheme under his emergency powers. Um, but what he has done, and, and we've actually started compiling this because we've got, we hear from a lot of consumers who are freaked out about what's happening at some of the, like, like, there's not, I'm not saying that, we, you know, every dispensary has crowds of people that are too close or any of those things, but we get a lot of complaints from folks who are nervous. Um, and so we've started compiling actually the, the lists of dispensaries that are utilizing at least the, the bare minimum thing that, that Governor Pritzker allowed, which is curbside pickup. Um, some are not doing it because of staffing issues. Some are not doing it because of the configuration of their space or the, the traffic you know, flow in their area. There's no work where anybody could pull up. Um, some are not doing it because they didn't understand that they could. Um, so we're trying to get that resource together for, for consumers so that patients who don't want to, to go inside can switch to a dispensary that is, that is creating that opportunity for them. The other thing that the department is doing is making it a lot easier 
and waiving fees for folks to add caregivers. So, so the, the patients that are immune compromised can, um, without paying the added fee and, and without having to, to do it um, via snail mail, which was the only way to establish a caregiver relationship before, you can now submit them electronically and there's no fee payment um, to get a caregiver added uh, to your medical card so that, that um, as a patient, you can, can be um, a little bit more cautious. Um, so there, there, we have taken the steps that are sort of within a, a, the, the realm of possible um, to do what can be done to help folks. Um, but, you know, I do think delivery is a when, not if. Um, you know, I think that, as Sonia said, there, there are just a few boxes we have to check and figure out in between. You know, I, I, I remember when we were first talking about this, um, Michigan had a delivery set up at, at one point, and they had a, a rash of folks who were ordering product to rob the, the delivery people. So we have to make sure that when we're talking about an all cash business, we have ways to, to do cashless transactions so that those, those drivers can be safe, that those patients can be safe. So there, there are still some details to work out. Um, and frankly, getting the, the SAFE Act passed at the federal level would be a big first step to make sure that we can move to a cashless system. I hope that we can, um, you know, come to, to some sort of um, remedy soon for, for all of these. Patients. I hope so too. Speaking of consumption, um, the, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, supply. Um, supply has fallen short here in our state in the first few months, just as it has in, you know, every state with a, a newly legalized adult use program. There's time to set up, um, you know, cultivation centers, make sure that the business practices are built out and things like that. Um, but one of the things that we see uh, in our industry is that when supply falls short, it generally drives the prices up, which allows the black market to continue to thrive. So uh, currently in Illinois, I think we're limited to 21 cultivation centers. Uh, is that going to be enough to meet the true demand at a reasonable price point? And uh, if not, when could we expect to, to start seeing some changes? So I think that um, we, as you mentioned, every state had shortages. It's, it's just a given. Um, no matter how much time you allow between passage and implementation, uh, they, there are shutdowns within days. And we actually were able to go longer than most states um, before, before we saw, saw folks having to completely um, shut off supplies. Um, but we had the perfect storm of, of factors uh, here in Illinois. You know, we, we obviously we did the adult use. We also added a lot of conditions to the medical bill uh, or the medical program at the same time. So that brought in, that, that, was, that was unplanned demand that was added, honestly. Um, and then we saw the capital markets dry up so that the existing uh, growers were not able to follow through on their expansion plans that they had been working towards, you know, obviously knowing that this was coming. So if you, if you look at, at all of the existing growers, all of them have expansion plans approved, um, but that, that combination of added patient demand and the drying up of capital markets so that folks weren't able to access uh, uh, the funds needed to do those build outs um, really set us up in a, in a, in a more challenging uh, footing than we intended to be. That said, it is starting to ease a bit. Um, I, I do think that we probably would have seen a little bit more of a drop off in sales over the last couple months. Um, as the novelty buyers went back to Chardonnay. Uh, <laughs> and, but I think that this, this crisis has um, kept that demand pretty steady. Uh, I, have, I have said several times over the last month, thank God I legalized weed, uh, <laughs> because this, it, this has been, uh, and I hear from folks every day, like, this is what's keeping me level, you know? Um, but from the perspective of the, the you know, future supply, we wanted to make sure that the craft growers had an opportunity uh, to come online and, and get established and get a foothold in the marketplace. Those licenses um, will be let relatively soon. Um, that same problem of capital markets is gonna be a challenge to those licensees as well. Um, but you know, once that all happens, we'll have the, the hard pause and the demand study that, uh, and disparity study that will allow us to determine if the social equity uh, definitions made brought the changes to our industry that we hoped that they would. Um, and if they didn't, 
that disparity study is the ticket to much more explicit uh, um, language to, to pursue greater equity. The first big ones would ha come after that disparity study. The only the, the next whole scale licenses would be after that. Okay, and so the uh, in that disparity study, if I have it correctly, is supposed to be done by March first of twenty twenty one. Is that right? That sounds about right. I don't have it in front of me, but um, but if folks want to look at, we've got a great uh, visual aid on our website, um, a, a licensing timeline that shows each rollout, including the hard pause uh, for for the study, and that's at repcassidy.com. One thing that has helped with. Pro, uh, the amount of product available is that uh, the the bill that uh, Kelly uh, sponsored allowed for medical patients to grow their own in small amounts. And while um, they uh, medical patients still walk into a dispensary and find them out of product sometimes, um, some have turned to growing their own, which has eased some of that burden. But we still always have to be careful to make sure uh, that the law is followed and that there is always product on the shelves for the patients. They have to come first. And that's something that was unique. Again, a thing that I'm seeing picked up in other states, uh, to, unique to our law was, was that explicit language about preserving patient supply. Um, and, and again, as Lou said, you know, the devil's in the details and how it's enforced and and, and making sure that, that folks are really uh, doing it right. And we do hear about dispensaries you know, saying they're out of medical, but not of not out of adult use. And that's just a lie. You know, if they have product, it has to go to the patients first. Well, uh, I, I hope that uh, that we can get something figured out in terms of supply and demand. And I'm sure that it's something that we'll uh, we'll catch up soon. And uh, to all you investors out there, don't be scared to uh, to help us expand these grow facilities. There's huge demand for the product, and uh, a lot of people looking. So uh, find somebody to connect with. <laughs> Um, all right. So my final question um, has to do with uh, with regulations, right? Uh, cannabis is highly, highly regulated, uh, despite having a death toll of zero um, in terms of overdosing. Uh, we're still more regulated than uh, other industries like tobacco and alcohol. And now part of this uh, is due to the Cole Memorandum, right? Because we, we don't have federal legalization. So um, uh, we, we have these guidelines that the federal government's put out there that uh, people are, are scared of breaking. Um, for those of you at home who aren't familiar with the Cole Memorandum, this basically outlines some guidelines that said, hey, the federal government won't make it a priority to prosecute you if you follow these guidelines um, uh, to a T, right? Some of these guidelines are preventing um, the sale to minors, present, uh, preventing um, any kind of revenue from a legal cannabis business to going to a, a criminal organization like a gang or a cartel, um, and also preventing uh, you know, interstate transport to a, a state where it's it is not legal. Uh, part, that's part of the reason why you can only buy an ounce at the dispensary, because they don't want you to pick up a pound and then take it to a state where it, it's not yet legal. Um, so that being said, are, are all of these regulations really necessary? I mean, I think we can agree that you know strict IDing practices aren't a bad thing for any substance that's mind altering. Um, but uh, um, uh, as far as the strict regulations, are they all necessary? And once we see federal legalization, do you think some of these restrictions will uh, be lifted or will they tighten up? I think that eventually they will. Um, I, I think if you look at the history of prohibition, how long did it take before you could brew your own beer at home? Every timeline compresses the one after it, whether we're talking about, you know, I, I did this a lot. I talked about the parallels between my work for LGBTQ equality from, you know, trying to make sure people weren't fired at work. The, you know, the timeline from that to marriage equality in 2013, you know, was, was decades. Um, but each piece of it got shorter, right? We went from civil unions to marriage within a couple of years. And so, you know, that, that, will, that similar thing will apply here. Quite frankly, people evolve more quickly than politicians. And so, you know, Lou talked about, Lou made mention of, you know, maybe, maybe the medical bill was too restrictive, um, but we did what we had to do to get the votes on the bill, right? That's what you do. That's how you get there. And not everyone... Um, has districts like ours that um, that you're not afraid of the the male piece to you know declaring you know Cassidy as the queen of reefer madness. I mean, somebody did that in my district, I'd be like, I don't know, I don't know how much more the approval rating would go up, you know. Um, but but we we represent uh, you know we work with folks from all over the state and lots of folks who still believe that this is the devil's lettuce. 
And, and so making sure that we bring them along, that we do the public education necessary to, to acknowledge that, you know, perhaps we can pull back on this a little bit. Um, but again, you know, how long did it take before you could brew beer in your basement? The big change will come when the federal government lifts their restrictions on this product. When that happens, it'll give uh, some momentum to uh, some of the legislators all around the country that have been a little reticent to jump on board. Uh, when the federal government or the FDA or Congress in some way decides that they're going to lift the prohibition and we don't have to live anymore with the fiction that uh, the federal government will look the other way as long as we're following state law, I think this will open up a lot and be easier, not just in Illinois, but around the country to, to grow, uh, to dispense, and to use this product. I just want to say I concur with, uh, you know, Kelly and Lou in just that we still have a lot more work to do and that we will see hopefully those restrictions um, easing up once things are affected, um, you know, on a federal level. But until then, just like the states are leading right now, they shall continue to lead, right? Yeah. And so, you know, um, I find myself um, not just working you know, on the issue here in Illinois, continuing to educate people about it, you know, what they can and cannot do, continue to have workshops on helping people get involved in the business, but also going to other states to do the same. Um, you know, Illinois is being looked at as a model right now. And, you know, I find myself through my different associations, be they with the National Black Caucus of State Legislatures or um, Nobel, the National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women or the Council of State Governments or all of these other places where we go to network um, with the other states and state legislatures, they're very hungry um, to know what's going on in Illinois. And we're very hungry just to know what's going on in each other's states. And so I definitely see the states continuing to be a leader, you know, on this issue. And as, as long as we, um, you know, continue to develop the best practices, the best pilot programs and fund programs accordingly, we will be able to um, advise the federal government, they should know everything to do by the time legalization hits Congress. We should have it all figured out for them. And so hopefully we will, along with that, see a lot of these gray areas, um, especially around banking and security. We should see a lot of those restrictions hopefully lift. I think it's safe to say that uh, many of us are looking forward to when that day comes uh, and uh, we can take our cannabis uh, wherever we would like freely. Um, I'm so happy that, uh, that all you folks were able to join us for this panel today. Um, again, for everybody at home, uh, Representative Sonia Harper, uh, Representative Kelly Cassidy, and Representative Lou Lang uh, joining us on the panel today. Um, uh, we've got a lot more exciting content coming up for you uh, uh, for the rest of the day for our summit. Uh, so stay tuned um, and stay elevated, America. <laughs>